Hello and welcome to this very special episode of my Ultimate Guide series. Today we take an extensive look at one of the best naval aircraft ever built and one of my favorite aircraft of all time, the Chance Ward F-8 Crusader. Nicknamed the last gunfighter for reasons we'll discuss soon, the F-8 earned itself a legendary reputation as a versatile fighter aircraft over the skies of Vietnam with a stellar win to loss ratio. A truly remarkable aircraft, the Crusader was highly advanced for its time, with some unique features and systems that made the Crusader the premier dogfighter of the US Navy during the 1960s. Not only that, but the Crusader is also an immensely capable aircraft here in War Thunder as well, a true dogfighter's dream, and today I'm gonna show you all about it. We'll take an extensive look at the aircraft's history, the aircraft in game and then of course show you some of my best games with the thing. As always we'll start with the history part first and let me tell you I really went way and above in getting information for this aircraft. I read countless articles online, got myself some literature on the aircraft, um, w watched pilots interviews and documentaries and even got my hands on the 132nd scale trumpeter kit to just even get more in touch with the aircraft itself. Well, and because I just want the big crusader on my modeling shelf as well. <laughs> so yeah, let's start right with the history part. The aircraft that would become the F-8 Crusader would be designed according to a 1952 specification that called for an aircraft with the following features. A desired top speed of Mark 1.2 at 30,000 feet, that's 9,000 meters, Mark 0.9 at sea level, high level of climb, and exceptional maneuverability, long range, a low landing speed and equipment for carrier operations, as well as multiple armament in the form of guns, rockets and, when available, missiles. Of course the aircraft as a Navy, air as a Navy uh, airplane also needed foldable wings. Multiple companies would respond to the proposal with several interesting designs, some being completely new, other being um, adapted from already existing aircraft for naval use. And the competition was pretty stiff, Grumman for example entering the competition with their F-11F1F Super Tiger, a new and much more improved variant of their Grumman F-11. Chance Ward however appointed John Russell Clark as chief of the design team and the gentleman with the name of Lyman Josephs as his assistant. Chance Ward was by that time in a bit of a rough spot. The last two aircraft they designed for the Navy were some of a pair of duds. The F-6U Pirate was built in only 33 examples and was a total failure, while its successor, the F-7U Cutlass, was built in bigger numbers but suffered from a high accident rate and a bad reputation as the initial model had severe engine problems. Even though that bad reputation might be somewhat undeserving with the later models of the aircraft being much better with uh, more reliable engines and so on. Ward therefore needed a winner on their hands to keep their reputation and finances up. Ward was a company with a lot of heritage when it comes to building naval aircraft. The company was founded in 1917 and built a number of imported aircraft during the 1920s and 30s. Their golden hour however came during World War II when they designed and produced the famous F4U Corsair, which was built by the thousands and became one of the best carrier fighters of the Second World War. Now, with two aircraft regarded as failures on their hands, the new aircraft had to be good. So much so that the upcoming machine would be dubbed Ward's Last Chance, a play on the aircraft company's name. A choice of two engines was available, the Pratt & Whitney J57 or the Sapphire-derived Wright J65. With the J57 delivering much higher thrust and a powerful afterburner, the choice quickly fell onto the J57. The first iteration of the engine the aircraft was to receive was the Dash 11 variant, producing some 43 kN of thrust with 66 kN of thrust on afterburner. This was to deliver satisfying performance for the new aircraft. Almond would be a quartet of the then upcoming Colt Mark 12 20mm cannons. We talked about the Mark 12 in the F11 video already, but here is another short overview of the gun. The Mark 12 was the final evolution of the venerable Hispano Caesar HS404, which was extensively used during the Second World War. 
The Mark 12 was gas operated and optimized for a high rate of fire and muzzle velocity and therefore fired a rather light 20x 110mm shell at 1000 rounds per minute at 1010 meters per second. As a result of this, its explosive filler was less than the previous AM3 cannon. While this in theory all sounds good and dandy, in service the Mark 12 was less than satisfying, suffering from frequent falls and having a reputation of being unreliable. In addition to that, a retractable rocket tray was to be fitted to the aircraft as well. The aircraft took advantage of a number of aerodynamic novelties of the 1950s and lessons learned from the Korean War influenced the design heavily. The aircraft featured an all-flying tail, giving the aircraft better control at high speeds. You can clearly see this uh, feature here. Um, not only that, but the aircraft was also area-ruled for optimal high-speed performance. Uh, we touched again uh, on the subject of the area rule in the F-11 video. Um, although the effect of the area rule is less visible on the Crusader than, than on the F-11, uh, or even uh, the F-105 Thunder Chief, where it is very pronounced. A so-called dog tooth was installed on the leading edge right here. This basically has the same effect as the wing fences we talked about in the MiG-17 video, preventing airflow to travel along the leading edge and redirecting the airflow back over the wing, um, thereby preventing wing stall. This also improved the aircraft's yaw stability. The aircraft's most advanced feature ever would be its variable incidence wing. Instead of having only flaps like previous carrier aircraft, the aircraft's entire wing could be lowered or lifted into two positions, minus one degree for in-flight or to plus seven degrees for takeoff and landing. Additional slats at the leading edges further improved low speed and in-flight handling. This allowed the aircraft's fuselage to remain level relative to the carrier deck, improving visibility to the ground significantly. This in turn um, allowed the cockpit to remain relatively small and fared into the fuselage, reducing drag. There were however two negative sides to this. First of all, the visibility to the rear was terrible and because the wing pivoted during landing, the landing gear couldn't be built into the wing but had to be located in the fuselage. The landing gear was short and light, resulting in the aircraft sitting very low on the ground and parked on the flight deck, earning the Crusader the nickname of the Gator by carrier uh, service groups. The positives of the aircraft, however, hugely outweighed its negatives and the aircraft with the factory design number V383 officially won the competition and a contract for three prototypes was awarded to Vought in May of 1953. The first prototype, XF-8U1, was ready for flight tests on the 22nd of February 1955. Test pilot John Conrad was tasked with demonstrating the XF-8U's performance on the 25th of March 1955. After a single high-speed taxi run, Conrad took the prototype Crusader to the sky over Rogers Dry Lake, taking off with full afterburner at 180 knots, that's 337 km per hour. Testing the aircraft's qualities, Conrad then took the prototype Crusader to supersonic speed, breaking the sound barrier on the aircraft's maiden flight. The test flight was deemed, so, so, uh, was deemed extremely successful and Conrad had little complaints about the new fighter. The second prototype took to the sky on the 12th of June, again powered by Conrad over Carswell Air Force Base in Texas. Development went ahead so smooth and travel free that the first production F 8U 1 was rolled out the same day the first prototype completed its 100th flight. Again, the first production model was flown in by John Conrad. Around that time, further studies were already underway to improve the aircraft's power and all weather capabilities. Further tweaking and modifications of the aircraft were also undertaken. A request for in flight refueling capability for example, had been issued on the 1st of September 1955, which was subsequently tested on the second prototype and would be taken over into the production models. You can clearly see the, the, the door um, behind which the uh, in-flight refueling probe is housed. In January of the following year, the Crusader began its FIP, which stands for Fleet Indoctrination Program, which ran until the 3rd of March 1956. 
the two test squadrons that undertook this program, VF-32 and VF-AW-3, received the F-81, which did not have a radar set, clearly visible by the sharp nose cone. You can clearly see that the later models of the Crusader have this more rounded nose cone, which um, houses, an air, uh, houses a radar to give the aircraft better all-weather capabilities. The initial models of the Crusader were therefore strict day fighters. With production now well underway, the Crusader began its carrier flight trials aboard the brand new supercarrier USS Forrestal. Forrestal was significantly bigger than any carrier seen previously, and with the Crusader being a much more powerful aircraft than any previous Navy fighters, it was fitting to test the aircraft on this ship. These trials ended successfully on the 15th of April. Around that time, Transvort aircraft offered a photo reconnaissance version of the Crusader. A prototype of what would become the F-8UP would be converted from production model F-8U1, replacing its guns with photo cameras. This variant would first take to the sky on the 17th December of 1956, giving the Navy its first supersonic reconnaissance aircraft. With the F-8's tremendous performance, Vought sought to promote the new aircraft, and what better way to do it than with a new world speed record. The current one was held by the US Air Force, and the Crusader had the performance to beat it. The official goal was to hit 1000 miles per hour, that's 1609 kilometers per hour. US Navy Commander Duke Windsor was given the opportunity to fly the Crusader on the record flight, doing so on the 21st of August of 1956, reaching a staggering 1015 miles per hour. Ward seized the opportunity of the moment and would subsequently award every Crusader pilot that hit the 1000 mile per hour mark with a special pin, creating the 1000 mile per hour club. Another record took place on the 16th of July 1957 when future astronaut John Glenn made the first east to west coast crossing at supersonic speed. It took him 3 hours, 22 minutes and 50.05 seconds to do the crossing, 3 hours, 23 minutes and 8.3 seconds according to other sources. He flew a, f uh, a photo reconnaissance version of the Crusader. Windsor and the Navy itself would be presented with the Thompson Trophy following the record, while on the 17th December 1957 the Crusader also achieved the sought after Collier Trophy. VF-94 Red Lightnings was the first squadron to receive a fully worked up Crusader late in December of 1956, while VF-32 Swordsman became the first fully operational Crusader fleet squadron operating from the enormous USS Saratoga in 1957. It was around that time that the Aimland Sidewinder made its debut and the Navy quickly wanted the new weapon to be adopted as well, hence feasibility studies were undertaken to see how the weapon could be incorporated into the Crusader. Basically from the get-go the employment of missiles was planned on the Crusader, initially with a single launch rail on each side of the fuselage. It was decided to omit the ventrally mounted rocket ray and use that space for extra fuel tanks, and to add uh, distinctive Y-shaped pylons to each cheek of the aircraft, these positions being able to hold two missiles each for a total of four. These pylons could also carry the new Zuni air-to-ground rocket. These changes would be fully implemented from June 1960 onwards. The Crusader was also tested and subsequently certified to carry the AGM-12 Bullpup air-to-ground missile, adding yet further versatility to the fighter once that missile entered service with the F-8E. With ever more increasing operating hours on carriers and more and more Crusaders entering service, more experience was gained that influenced further Crusader production. One problem that was apparent was that the aircraft had a tendency to veer off course when launched. It was during this time that the aircraft gained the reputation as an ensign eliminator. While great to fly in the air, the F-8U had a high sink rate, and with its short landing gear and low ground clearance, landings could not be made at high angles of attack. While the variable incidence wing was designed to make this unnecessary in the first place, new pilots had to adapt to the new feature, which was never seen before on any aircraft. The landing gear caused the most concern since it was too weakly constructed, leading to a lot of landing mishaps. Subsequent work on the Crusader um, would culminate in the XF-8 EU-2 prototype, a more refined version of the current Crusader. Once again it was John Conrad who would pilot the aircraft on its first flight. The new variant featured two ventral fins, 
right here, that cured the stability problems during takeoff as well as the inherent snaking the aircraft displayed at high altitude and high speed. A more powerful J57P16 engine and a new limited all-weather radar, the Magnavox ANAPS67 search radar, um, while later production models had the ANAPQ83 radar, were also installed. It featured a slightly reduced wingspan and a Martin Baker MKF5 low altitude ejection seat. This variant would enter service with use as Forrestal in 1958 and would be called the F8C under the new designation system starting from 1962 onwards. F8U2 would replace the U1 model on the production line after 318 had been built, with 187 of the newer model ultimately being assembled. The F8U2N or F8D would be the first variant to employ the four Sidewinder Air 2 Air missiles on the Y pylons and would receive the ANAPQ 83 radar. The aircraft's missiles were of the AIM-9B type, the first production version of the famous Sidewinder missile to enter service. The AIM-9 was a heat seeker designed to lock onto the exhaust trail of an enemy aircraft and follow that heat source, then exploding when near the target. It had a caged seeker, meaning firing the missile in hard maneuvers was pointless. In service, the missile was less than stellar, it often locked onto bogus heat sources like the sun and could be easily evaded by overloading the seeker head by turning sharply into it. Nevertheless, it offered a more standoff capability and against unexpected targets proved to be deadly. It used a 4.5 kg blast fragmentation warhead and the missile had a weight of 70 kg and could attain a speed of Mark 1.27. The F-8D entered service in 1960. It was powered by the J57P20 or P20A engine and 152 were ultimately built. The follow-on version would become probably the best known of all the Crusaders, the F-8E. This variant introduced an IRST, Infrared Search and Track System, the, A the ANAAS-15, recognizable by the small bulge in front of the canopy right here. It would also equip the ANAPQ-94 radar. The prototype, once again piloted by John Conrad, took to the sky on the 13th of June 1961. The F-8E would be the last built version for the US Navy. This was the first variant to employ the AGM-12 Bullpup air-to-ground missile and therefore had a hump on its back that housed the necessary electronics. This variant could employ the radar-guided AIM-9C version and was the only type to ever carry that missile. Also in 1961, Vought merged with Ling Temco to create Ling Temco Vought, which is why the Crusader is also sometimes called the LTV F8. Meanwhile, the French Navy showed considerable interest in the type, and in 1963, 42 F8Es were built to French specifications, giving rise to the F8E FN. A BLCS boundary layer control system was fitted since French carriers were smaller than their American counterparts. The addition of the BLCS allowed for lower sink rates. Furthermore, the leading edge flaps were modified and pipes now ran through the wing, blowing compressed air over the trailing edge flap, a concept known as a blown flap. This uh, further improved the approach handling of the aircraft. All this resulted in a reduced approach speed of 15 knots and improved handling, addressing one of the F-8's biggest points of criticism. French Crusaders operated from the carriers Clemenceau and Foch, and I am pretty sure I completely butchered those names, <laughs> and um, these were the last Crusaders ever built. French Crusaders also differed in their armament. They could equip the Matra R530 or the Matra Magic 1 missile. The R530 was available in infrared and radar guided versions. It attained speeds of up to Mach 2.7 and two of the 190 kg heavy missiles could be carried. The Magic 1 meanwhile was the French equivalent to the AIM-9 Sidewinder. It was 89 kg heavy and highly maneuverable. A single two-seat Crusader, nicknamed fittingly the Two-Seder, was built to make a trainer version of the F8. However, despite the Navy showing interest, it would remain a prototype. The single designated TF-8A would be lost in a crash in 1978. NASA operated several Crusaders for test purposes, including one modded 
with a super critical wing and a fly-by-wire test bed as well. In the meantime, photo reconnaissance crusaders played a key role in obtaining intelligence during the Cuban Missile Crisis when RF-8A crusaders from United States Navy and US Marine Corps dashed over the islands and obtained high-resolution pictures of Soviet missile installments. In 1963, the Crusader would be given the honor of being the first aircraft type to be operated on the newly commissioned USS Enterprise. Production run ended after 1,219 aircraft were built in 1965, the last aircraft being a French Navy F-8EFN. Despite that, US Crusaders would underwent significant improvement programs that would see their capabilities and designations changed. 89 F-8Ds would be refurbished into F-8Hs, being equipped with the J57P-20 engine, an approach power compensation computer system for better landing handling, and the life expectancy rose to 4000 hours with the fitting of a new wing. The aircraft now had full all weather capability and could carry more payload. 25 of these were refurbished again and sold to the Philippine Air Force under the designation F-8P, while an extra 10 were used for spare parts. The Philippines would operate their Crusaders until 1991, when the machines, parked outside, fell victim to the ash fallout of the 1991 eruption of Mount Pinatubo. The F-8E would be modified into the F-8J. This version was extensively modified, being equipped with the J-57P-420 engine, carried a new all-weather radar, the ANAPQ-124 Magda, received the same 4000-hour wing with a boundary layer control system, reinforced landing gear and underwing pylons. Recognized by pilots as the most capable Crusader variant, it was this one that would score the most kills over Vietnam. F-8K and F-8Ls were F-8C and F-8Bs rebuilt with the same modifications as the other types to bring them up to standard. 87 and 61 were rebuilt respectively. The remaining F-8As were, while being proposed, not upgraded. Likewise, the photo reconnaissance crusaders were also extensively modified, with better engines and wings and redesignated RF-8G, with 73 being converted. The F-8s claim to fame of course came during the Vietnam War. Crusaders were some of the first aircraft to operate over hostile territory in April of 1965, deploying from the aircraft carrier USS Hancock. Crusaders operated from the smaller World War II Essex-class aircraft carriers, which made landing operations for the Crusaders even more precarious than they were already. At the beginning of hostilities, the World War II-era Essexes carried two fighter squadrons each, uh, two fighter squadrons each with 12 Crusaders. The bigger Forrester-class carriers, meanwhile, operated the, uh, the Crusaders' main rival in the US Navy, the Air Force Phantom a much bigger two-seater that was built with a different design philosophy than the Crusader, focusing more on a more standoff missile-based style of combat rather than the close-in dogfighting capabilities the Crusader displayed. This went so far as that early Phantoms didn't even carry a gun, something that would come to bite their pilots in the ass over Vietnam. Operating out of the Gulf, Gulf of Tonkin, so-called Yankee Station, and from land-based US Marine Corps squadrons, Crusaders flew missions in the air-to-air, -air, escort, and even the air-to-ground role. Conditions on the carriers weren't easy, the Essexes were cramped compared to the larger Forrestal and Midway classes, and the hot weather made Crusader pilots appreciate the climbed cockpit of their aircraft. At around that time, Crusaders also received a new weapon, the AIM-9D. Developed to address some of the shortcomings of the AIM-9B then in service, the AIM-9D was a definite upgrade. It featured a new rocket motor, the Hercules Mark 36, giving the missile more burn time. The most important feature, however, was the increase in track rate and better overload, whereas the old 9B could only be fired from 20 degrees angle of attack from an enemy aircraft's tailpipe, the 9D could do so at 40 degrees. It could also be launched at higher gym limits. A cold seeker also improved the heat sensitivity of the missile. The optical seeker field was enlarged while the IR seeker was limited in its field of view. The seeker remained caged. Lastly, the missile received a new Mark 48 warhead. It was fitted with an expanding steel rod that upon detonation would fan out and rip through anything in its way. 
Both the AIM-9D and the AIM-9C, however, would remain very, very rare missiles. Only a thousand of each were, were built. Crusader pilots also benefited from better training with missiles, something their Air Force counterparts somewhat lacked at the time. The result was that the Crusader, despite its moniker as the last gunfighter, achieved most of its kills with the AIM-9 rather than with its 20mm cannons. Crusaders quickly proved themselves to be the quintessential dogfighter of the US Navy. Fast and maneuverable, with a top speed of 1227 miles per hour, that's 1974 km per hour, at 36,000 feet, 10,973 meters, and a ring loading of 377 kg per square meter, the F-8 made for a fine dogfighter that, thanks to its versatile armament, could adapt well to combat environment. The engine gave the aircraft a huge amount of power, so much so that the Crusader could actually take off with its wings still folded. Crusader pilots quickly learned that against the North Vietnamese MiG-17, the Crusader was far superior in the vertical rather than in the horizontal, and employed tactics according to that. The Crusader's excellent high-speed performance also meant that dogfighting MiGs at high speeds was preferable, as the MiG-17 was able to outturn the heavier Crusader at low speeds. Crusader pilots also took advantage of the Crusader's high roll rate. With their good training and an excellent aircraft at their hands, the pilots achieved a stellar 19 to 1 KD with 16 MiG-17s and three of the vaunted MiG-21s shot down. All three Crusaders lost in air combat were shot down early in the war in 1966, showing how quickly US Navy pilots adapt to the air combat over Vietnam. Fighter squadrons from the USS Bonham Richard were the most successful. One of the biggest advantages the F-8 offered over its opponents was its way more capable radar with which, it could, with which it could search and track its opponents. The MiG-21 appeared in more noticeable numbers during the ongoing conflict and was a more dangerous opponent to the Crusader thanks to its, uh, thanks to its speed that made it able to stay on an F-8. Its Delta main wing also gave the aircraft good initial angles of attack, but the aircraft lost a lot of speed during a turn inherent to its wing design, something Crusaders could use to their advantage. Nevertheless, no Crusader was lost to MiG-21s, while they in turn shot down three of the vaunted Delta-winged fighter. Crusaders were also tasked with supporting ground forces and could be equipped with bombs and, anti uh, and uh, AGMs, something Crusader drivers heavily disliked since they saw themselves as true fighter pilots. If the Crusader had its, had its own reputation, so certainly had the men that flew the aircraft into combat. And they were some of the most well-trained airmen anywhere in the world, unlike in the US Air Force and their Phantoms, which emphasized missile capability over anything else, the simple fact that the F-8 carried guns and was a true air superiority fighter meant that Crusader pilots had an edge in the close quarters air combat that often took place in the skies over Vietnam. The Phantoms were also hampered by the fact that they had to visually identify a bogey before they were cleared to attack limiting the F-4's BVR capabilities severely. Crusader pilots were aggressive and even somewhat cocky at times. They had their own badge, a pilot with a tear running down his face and a phrase that read, when you're out of F-8s, you're out of fighters. Richard Schaffer, one of the most famous Crusader pilots, is known to have said that no Crusader pilot ever had fear of another aircraft, and that when you are, into, when you are near Crusader, you are king. Schaffer was involved in one of the most breathtaking dogfights of the entire war when he alone took on four MiG-17s and two MiG-21s that dashed in and fired their Atoll missiles before departing for an astonishing 15 minutes before the fight solved without either side claiming a kill. During the fight, Schaffer encountered one of the most severe problems of the aircraft, that being its armament. The 20mm guns frequently jammed during high G turns, with the ammo links breaking under the stress. This problem would trouble the F-8 throughout Vietnam and most likely more kills would have been scored if not for the unreliability of the Colt Mark 12. Another less talked about problem were the ejection seats. While they reliably propelled pilots out of the aircraft, there were a high amount of back injuries resulting from these launches, often leaving pilots unable to fly for weeks or even months. Despite that, the Crusader soon earned the nickname MiG Master for its stellar win record. 
While only three crusaders were lost to enemy fighters, the fact that it would also be employed as a bomber or attack aircraft frequently brought it into surface-to-air missile and AA gun range, where it would suffer more losses than in the air. By the end of hostilities, 170 aircraft had been lost to ground fire and accidents. With the war over, the US Navy would retire the Crusader in 1976 in the fighter role, while the reconnaissance Crusaders would be operated until 1987 by the Naval Reserve, before they too were retired. This gave the Crusader an astonishingly long career. The aircraft was first only expected to have a life expectancy of 2000 hours and was then refitted with the new 4000 hour wing once it became clear that the aircraft would serve for far longer than intended. Some Crusaders even significantly surpassed the 4000 flight hours. The French were the last operators of the F-8. They still had them in service during Desert Storm but did not use them during that campaign. French Crusaders received similar upgrades to American ones to expand their service life, receiving 4000 hour wings and were completely rewired. Aircraft modified as such were designated F-8P and they were operated until 2000 when the last ones were replaced by the Salt or Fails, bringing the Crusader's career to an end. Developed from the Crusader was the LTV A7 Corsair II, a dedicated attack aircraft that basically resembles a subsonic stubby F8 and was used in large numbers. Another offshoot was the XF8U3 Crusader III, an enlarged interceptor version that was more missile focused and directly competed with the F4 Phantom, losing in the end to its competitor. Also known as the Super Crusader, the XF8U3 bore a superfi superficial resemblance to the F8, but was in all entirety a completely new aircraft. It was powered by the more powerful J75 engine that powered the Thunder Chief and the F106. Developing 131 kN of afterburner, the engine propelled the Crusader 3 to Mach 2.39. Armed with guns and missiles, the aircraft would have made for a powerful interceptor, but the Phantom's larger payload and multi-purpose role ultimately won it the contract. And with that, we come to an end for, um, for the history part. What a journey! But yeah, I really wanted to uh, do this aircraft justice. This really is uh, an aircraft that has a very special place in my heart. I really, really like this aircraft. And today there are a lot of Crusaders uh, still around in museum all over the world. So if you're lucky, you might be able to see one. Well then, let's take a look at the F-8 Crusader here in game. Well, first of all, you get the choice of two Crusaders, the F-8U and the F-8E, which will be the main focus of this video. And the F-8E is really the only one you want to be playing. This is because the F-8U, for some reason, very easily rips off its wings in high G maneuvers and it's extremely frustrating. I've died to more wing rips than to enemy aircraft with this thing. Should you be flying the F-8U2, you really need to limit your high G maneuvers. Also take off the upgraded boosters modification as this helps reducing the wing rip. The F-8E on the other hand doesn't suffer from the wing rip if you take off the boosters. Um, only during rolling and turning at the same time can the wings come off. Also avoid turning too sharply with your air brake deployed above 1000 km per hour. Both Crusaders sit at the same BR of 10.3 and are very similar to each other. The F-8E benefits from a more powerful J-57 engine and a more advanced radar. The AN-APS-67 of the F-8U2 is only a search radar, while the AN-APQ-94 of the F-8E is able to search and track. Together with the F-8E's radar missiles, it makes the Crusader E a more flexible aircraft. Speaking of the missiles you'll get a choice of two. Well, three really, but the third ones are A9Bs and no one really wants to use these at 10.3. Um, the IR missile of choice is the AIM-9D, which is available on both Crusaders. This improved AIM-9B has still a caged seeker and the IR seeker is even smaller in its field of view, which means you need to watch your launch angles. However, it has a bigger optical seeker and far better tracking rate, and with its 18G overload, the missile is quite capable at its BR. However, its biggest benefit comes in the form of the uh, new Mark 36 rocket motor, which gives the AIM-9D 
far longer burn time than its predecessor, than its predecessor. Whereas you wanted to fire an AIM-9B at less than 2 km ideally, you can get reliable kills with the AIM-9D from 4 km away. Since no one really expects these long range AIM-9 shots, it also makes the chances of them hitting the target much bigger. This gives the Crusader a more standoff capability compared to many Russian aircraft that are equipped with the more dogfight oriented but shorter ranged R60. Then you'll also get access to the AIM-9C, a radar guided version of the AIM-9. This one has quite a big seeker and can be fired from more difficult angles if you lead the target properly. Even at closer ranges, getting kills with this missile um, are possible. However, as you can see, you need to fire this missile uh, below 9 km. Um, it is very maneuverable at 18G overload and especially in head-on head -on engagements, unless you chaff it, it's basically impossible to avoid. The radar of the Crusader E, however, doesn't have look-down, shoot-down capability. Although you'll get lucky sometimes and it can acquire lock in, uh, in more um, at lower altitudes, firing a missile in such situations is not really advised since the radar lock can be broken at any moment because of ground clutter and then you have just wasted a missile. Um, the aim and c is particularly useful in down tiers since few enemy players take chaff with them since there aren't really any good radar missiles at that BR, except of course for the M9C itself and the R3R. And the R3R is even rarer since most MiG-21s that can use them um, instead go for the full 4R60 loadout. The ideal loadout for your F8E is either 4 M9Ds, which I would prefer to use in uh, up tiers, or 2 9Ds and 2 9Cs. Unfortunately, you cannot equip one AIM-9C and three AIM-9Ds, even though that would be the overall best setup. Additionally, you can equip bombs, rockets, and even the AGM-12 bullpup, so if you want to use this in ground battles, it has that capability. However, the F-8 really is built for the dogfighter role, and there are better aircraft for bombing or ground attacking than the F-8. Speaking of the uh, modifications and loadouts, what you really want to go first and absolutely need to go first are the flares and chaff. This is the most important modification you want to get early on. After that, you want to either go, depending on your playstyle, either go for the flight performance modifications or the weapons modifications, particularly the missiles. You really want to get the missiles. Um, Keep the bomb and rocket modifications for last, in the meantime get more flight performance mod, st stuff like the G-suit, and skip the new boosters altogether, you can research them last and then not equip them. As its nickname, The Last Gunfighter, suggests, you'd also get four 20mm cold Mark 12 cannons mounted in pairs on each cheek. They fire fast and accurate but their damage output is not the best since they fire rubber like shells. One good thing about the Crusader is that you can select between the two sets of cannons, which allows you to fire only two guns at a time, conserving overall ammunition. Ideally, you want to be using the, the, the default belts, since uh, they actually have the most HE rounds. The Crusader overall might be one of the most balanced aircraft in the game BR-wise. It's very powerful in a down tier and still capable in an up tier, but not OP, even though I am particularly good with it, but that's mostly because the aircraft just fits my playstyle so well. I maintain a good 3 to 1 KD with the aircraft and it's steadily improving. While it's tremendously capable, it's balanced by the lack of any RWR, which means you need to keep track of your surroundings, particularly in up tiers where more capable um, radar missiles are flying around. And also, of course, it's balanced by its enormous repair costs. This thing costs 18,040 silver lines to repair. Even the F8U2 still costs 15,000. You really don't want to be flying the Crusader if you're low on money and don't know what you're doing. It's not the best moneymaker either, and it will quickly melt down your pool of lions if you're not careful. 
However, because the F8E um, actually sits at rank uh, 7, it is a great grinder for top tier. And if you enjoy playing an aircraft built for the dogfighter role, the Crusader is the right choice for you. As for skins, you'll get one for the FAU from the Hell's Angel Squadron, which is an absolutely gorgeous looking skin if you ask me. And for the F8E, unfortunately, you don't get any skins that you can unlock. Even though there are two I would love to see. One is of course NM400 from VF194 based on the USS Ticonderuga, probably the most colorful of all Crusaders built. Uh, this one was operated and sadly lost over Vietnam to a surface-to-air missile. And then there's... Uh, the aircraft with the number 15328, which was operated by VMF AW 235 Dev Angels. I really love the um, red uh, air intake with the white with the white stars. I think it looks very good on this aircraft. I sure hope that both of these skins might come at some point, either to be unlockable or on the uh, marketplace, because I would totally buy either one of them. But yeah, so far for the aircraft in game, let's then talk about um, how to fly the F8 Crusader. Well, and now on how to fly the F8 Crusader. By the way, we are here in the test flight and we are on the USS Forrestal, one of the um, aircraft, aircraft carriers on where the Crusader was historically tested on. Now, the Crusader features a playstyle that is rather unusual for its BR. While most other aircraft emphasize high speed and powerful missiles at 10.3 to 11.0 like the F4 Phantoms or are only really maneuverable in the first stages of a dogfight like the Mirages or MiG-21s, um, the Crusader is a thoroughbred dogfighter that is equipped with decent missiles. Its J57 engine gives the fighter a good power to weight ratio, giving the Crusader in turn very good acceleration. As you can see, this thing has no problems getting up to speed. While its acceleration is good, top speed on the relevant altitude CN War Thunder is rather low. It's barely able to break the uh, sound barrier on the deck, making the F8 one of the slowest aircraft at its BR actually. Therefore running from your, opponent in, from your opponent in tricky situations is rarely successful. As you can see I am well, just now I should be able to, to go supersonic even it, it goes barely supersonic. If you have anything other than the missiles equipped um, like um, uh, rockets or bombs you will stay below the speed of sound with this aircraft on the deck. It really is on the slower side. However, what it lacks in speed, it certainly makes up for in maneuverability. The Crusader is a highly maneuverable dogfighter at the right speeds. While it does have decent performance above 1000 km per hour and above, as you can see that turn rate is not bad, um, it truly, really shines. Um, oops, <laughs> wrong button there. <laughs> but yeah, it truly, really shines um, between 700 and 800 kilometers per hour, where the F8 is able to make incredibly tight turns. Well, let's just demonstrate. Come on. Look at that turn rate. This with. Um, coupled with the very good roll rate of the Crusader and its frontally mounted guns makes the F8 extremely good for scissor maneuvers as well as the classic turn and burn dogfight. It has a huge and very effective air brake. Use this frequently to force overshoots or to get down to the Crusader's preferred dogfight speeds. Be careful however uh, when you decide to deploy the air brake. It is great for initiating one versus ones but if you're not careful of your surroundings, it will leave you open for an attack by a third party. One-on-ones are really this aircraft's big strength. There are very few aircraft that can beat a Crusader 
in a one versus one battle. To further increase its turning uh, abilities, you can also deploy flaps in combat settings, which is helpful at uh, very low speeds. What sets the aircraft apart from other dogfighters, however, is its amazing energy retention. The Crusader keeps its speed really well in uh, sustained dogfights. Coupled with its powerful engine, it is quickly able to react to changes in the dogfighting when flown by a skilled pilot. A mix of horizontal and vertical maneuvers is advisable with the Crusader. Going vertical against an aircraft that has lost its energy in a dogfight is a very simple tactic to set you up for an easy kill. While the airframe itself is built for close range turn and burn dogfights, the same can't be said for its weaponry. Which uh, might uh, at first sound counterintuitive, but actually gives the Crusader a lot of flexibility. The missiles themselves are both best used for medium um, to long range engagements. The AIM-9D is not really a good close range weapon, but excels in long range above 3 km missile shots while the AIM-9C is great for long-range and head-on engagements. Learning when and what missile to fire is a key aspect of becoming good with the, with the FA Crusader. Avoid AIM-9C shots at too low of altitude or when your opponent is diving. For these kinds of scenarios, the AIM-9D is better. Also, try to test your opponent first before firing the radar missiles. At 10-3, not, not all players take chaff into battle. A lot of enemy aircraft have an RWR equipped. Looking, uh, locking them up with your radar will warn them by setting off an alarm in their cockpit. Lots of players will lose their nerve and try to break lock with the aircraft um, that has them picked up by chaffing it. If your opponent does not try to chaff, there's a good chance he hasn't chaff equipped, making an AIM-9C shot viable. As with all aircraft, situational awareness is key, especially since the Crusader doesn't have an RWR equipped. Let's now for a moment look at the opposition you'll be likely facing. MiG-21s will be your main rival. The 21 is faster than you and cannot climb you, particularly the MF, SMT and the MiG-21 BIS. They are usually armed with ER-60 missile, although some cheeky players, me included, um, Toss in the occasional R3R just for shits and giggles. MiG 21s can be dangerous opponents as they can pull incredibly sharp angles of attack on you, but lose all their energy in doing so owing to a delta wing design. Try to avoid the initial shot, which is not very difficult to do. Deploy full air brake and cut power, then turn or roll to throw them off. If correctly deployed, this maneuver will force the enemy to overshoot. Low on energy after the initial turn, the MiG-21 will then be an easy target for the Crusader, which will be, then be at its best maneuvering speed. And to demonstrate what we just talked about, I'm here with a MiG-21 on my tail. He's fired a missile, I easily decoy it, switch back to the ASO-25, fire an AM-9D at him, FOX-2, then immediately switch back to the MiG-21, multitasking at its finest. I'm now making sure he does not get uh, a missile shot at me. The S25 is dead. I now can fully focus on the MiG-21, deploy the air brake, turn sharply into him, then pitching up, rolling, trying to force the overshoot, even deploying my landing gear to just further slow me down. Another roll and I have now forced the MiG-21 to overshoot and with the F8's great low speed handling, I'm able to get the frag on him. This sort of maneuver can be used against all Delta-winged aircraft. Mirages and MiG-21s are particularly susceptible to this sort of maneuver. It is more difficult to pull off against the, the Zarp J-35, since that thing is able to pull crazy maneuvers even at low energy. Against the J-35, it is more advisable to force him into a turn where he has to bank hard and then go vertical, taking advantage of the Crusader's powerful engine and acceleration. Stuff like A5s and MiG-19s are more dangerous opponents since they turn very well and have much better energy retention than MiG-21s. Try to vary your throttle, deploy the air brake as necessary and uh, make use of your flaps and slats. 
The dogfights against these aircraft will be some of the most exciting you can get, since it really depends on the skill of the player who comes out on top. Tornadoes are also a regular sight. They carry two potent A9Ls, but are otherwise no real threat to the Crusader. Avoid dogfights with F5Cs and Mirage F1s. They have similar energy retention to you, but can turn even better. The F5 is omnipresent at this BR and can be a real headache to deal with. It is able to keep up with you in speed and can turn even tighter while also having fewer, but in my opinion better, 20mm cannons. Try to use surprise tactics against F5 players. Many of them are new players that buy the F5C for its ergonomics and money making potential. Avoid the Mirage F1 at all cost. The F1 is able to turn fight with you at lower speeds and carries much, much better missiles than you, as well as having a far superior radar set. It is also faster than you by quite a lot. Thankfully, the F1 is a rather rare sight at this BR. Another very dangerous opponent can be the F4J. Its Doppler radar gives it the long range edge coupled with its AIM-7Fs. If you notice an F4J has picked you up and fired a long range missile, try to notch the radar by flying perpendicular to it and deploy chaff. If you get the chance to get close to an F4J, um, do so, as getting close minimizes his chances of getting an effective missile lock. Once you are behind him, there's almost nothing an F4J can do against you. All other aircraft like Phantoms, F-104s, Sukhois, MiG-23s and the like can be easily outflown by the Crusader in a traditional way. I would advise to take uh, 30 minutes of fuel on regular maps. This gives you enough time to stay in the air even on full afterburner. Also, set up a button to switch between your armament. The cannons can be fired in sets of two. As you can see here, I am now firing only the first set and now I am switching to the second set. Lastly, I can also of course fire all four cannons at the same time. This will certainly help you in conserving ammunition. When you are down tiered, or at around 10-7, go ahead and take the Crusader as high up as possible. Set up your radar and see what it picks up. I usually uh, like to set my radar up in the narrower search cone, since um, that makes it easier for me to uh, track an enemy target. Uh, you want to go as high as possible in these down tier scenarios since there aren't f uh, that much uh, high tier uh, radar missiles up in the sky and in turn this allows you to deploy your radar missiles um, very effectively since there is no ground clutter to confuse your radar. It also allows you to perch yourself high above the battlefield like a hawk to pick up your next target. From there you work your way down and shoot missile and guns as you see fit. Down tiers will uh, have lots of SU-25s and A-10s, which are easy kills for the maneuverable F-8 Crusader. Always remember that there are some very potent missiles flying around, both in down and up tiers. One lapse of awareness could mean a one-way trip back to your hangar. Thankfully, the Crusader does not have a very high heat signature. When someone fires a heat seeker at you, it is usually enough to just turn off the afterburner and deploy one set of flares to decoy an enemy missile. Even AIM-9Ls usually get decoyed that way. And lastly, we need to talk about landing the F-8 Crusader. Its unusual wing gives the aircraft a very low landing speed for a jet of its BR. However, it generates so much lift that you realistically only can land the aircraft at low speed since um, otherwise it tends to float over the runway. If you need to land fast, you might want to um, land without the wing in the landing position. Keep in mind also that the Crusader doesn't get a brake parachute, so leave enough room to land or you overshoot the runway. Well, so much for the theory. I think it's time to really show you this aircraft capabilities in battle. And it seems we have found ourselves in an up tier. There are MiG 23s and F4s involved, so. Yeah. 
We are keeping the Crusader here at medium altitude. Uh, we don't want to really fall victim to any Doppler radars, but at the same time we don't want to be that close to the ground. To just uh, give us a little bit of extra flexibility. F4E spotted. And we are setting him up so that we are on his 6. Diving down. He goes supersonic, but he's making the mistake that he is trying to turn which gives me the opportunity to catch up to him. I'll lock him up with the radar but nah try to try using the guns nope he has certainly uh oh my god oh that guy's <laughs> really messing up my shots here but now yeah that's it there's my first kill Two F5s ahead. Cork off an AM9D. He flares the missile, but he's not. Uh, he probably is still an afterburner. Which means the missile is still tracking. And there's my second kill. Quickly lock up the second F5. Come on. Try to get a few shots in, but I miss again. No problem though. Still have the missiles left. Fire an AM9C and the missile hits its target for my third kill. Now as you can see I have only one set of cannons selected. I do this to really conserve my ammunition since uh, these Cold Mark 12s are firing pretty rapidly and you don't want to uh, diminish all your ammunition at once. And having two cannons um, on standby certainly helps with that. Now choice of three targets available. Going for the A10s and he's the nearest target. And you quickly, you, you, um, you saw how quick the battles um, take place. I got like three kills in less than two minutes. It just really shows how, how, top, how the uh, environment at top tier is. Everything happens much faster than in prop planes. It almost feels a little bit, a little bit like air arcade. And we are closing in on the A10, and it's time to make a gunfighter mean something. That certainly hit his engines, it seems, but was enough to down him. No problem, however. I yo-yo the Crusader around, and just look how quickly that thing turns. And there is kill number four. Another gun kill, so we have like uh, yeah, one shot of an ace. However, I should be heading back to base soon since my fuel state is not the best right now. Team has cleared up, killed the F4. Alright. I think now it's time to head back to base, but that's when I spot the F5, and I am having a go at trying to get him. I still have two missiles left. Lock him up with the radar, and waiting for the AIM-9C to acquire the target. Instead, firing an AIM-9D, but he flares the missile. Still have him lock up with the radar, but he's now so close to the ground that my A9C will never never track, so I try to kill him clinging with the guns, but I miss. No problem. I take the Crusader into the vertical again, even though I'm very low on fuel right now. And then the Mirage comes in and gets the kill on the F5C, which means I now have less than a minute of fuel remaining and desperately need to get back to base. Which is 22 kilometers away, however, I, if I put the Crusader at... Uh, 38% power, that's certainly enough. And there's the last enemy aircraft, an A70, hoping for the team to uh, keep him off my 6. And he is breaking away, so I can safely return to base. But yeah, that battle pretty much shows how the Crusader. Um, can be flown successfully even at top tier. 
it is more difficult than doing it at uh, than in a, in a down tier or when you are top tier but still the crusader even at an up tier can be really fun to play however as always uh, it really requires uh, situational awareness you really need to look around even more so in, uh, in, a, in an up tier because there are so many more capable missiles flying around um, and if you're not careful they will knock you out of the sky anyways I am slowing down here trying to get uh, below 500 km per hour deploy the air brake but then uh, no active players left in the enemy team we have won this right as I am touching down and that's a nice 4 kill battle in an up tier with the F8 Crusader so then let's look at the results we got from this battle come on load I don't know why, but these, these title screens, they take forever to load. Ah, there we are. Top of the leaderboard, 4 kills, almost 30,000 credits and almost 4,000 RP. And we are in the next match already. We have the Crusader equipped with the standard loadout of 2 M9Cs, 2 M90s and we're heading straight into battle. Uh, of course, trying trying not to climb as high as possible to give our radar free search range and get some aim nine C shots in. All right, so far radar hasn't picked up anything, although I already see some stuff in the distance. Okay, first aircraft spotted, lock him up on the radar. Oh no, that, that A5 is a uh, more serious threat right now. Fox 1, missile away, and the M9C tracks beautifully to the target. Kill number 1. Trying to get into... Uh, oh no, no, no. Evade the shots of the MiG-21. Ah, oh, come on, can I get... Uh, no, no, no. Nah, try to get another missile shot in, but he was the closing range was too quick. I doubt my missile would have tracked him. So we are getting some distance in, then looping around. Seems that MiG-21 has the same idea. And now I should be able to get the A9C off the rails. Come on. It's locked. Fox 1, he has fired a missile, we are decoying it. Unfortunately, he doesn't have any chaff, and boom, there's kill number two. Whew, two for two for the AIM-9C, two nice radar kills. Trying to position ourselves for a missile shot on the tornado there. AIM-9D up, and FOX-1, uh, FOX-2. That looks good, and yes, it has hit the target. Third kill. So far, every missile has been a hit. Oh, what's that? Another tornado. Let's see if we can get him as well. We're tr trying to attack from below. Maybe he won't notice me. Uh, oh, no, he has, he has, he has. Okay, he has launched an aim then L. Decoy that missile. Then continue the upwards motion with a loop. And... Uh, is he? Oh, okay, he's died to the J-35's AIM-9. Uh, okay, not gonna go for that. He's finished. Okay, there's another SU-25. Let's see if we can get him. He's the last one on the enemy team. Come on. Is he? Okay, oh, oh, he's gonna head on. Okay, no, 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 no. Evade that. Again, looping the Crusader around to posi position ourselves for another missile shot. And Fox 2, missile away. And he isn't, yeah, he hasn't flared it. 
which means four kills for the F8 Crusader. I mean, and that was... How long was this match? Five minutes? That was quick. That was really, really quick. Yep, four kills. And number one on, the, on our team. And here are the results. For such a short match, actually not too shabby. But, yeah. Oh, not bad at all, actually. So, and we are far away into uh, one of the winter maps. Beautiful looking, by the way. And we are in a slight update. There are tornadoes involved. And we have locked up our first target with the radar, a kafir. Okay, let's activate the NNC, wait for it to acquire the target. Okay, he has fired a missile. Uh, come on, missile away, Fox 2, and boom! It actually hits the target even at that close range. And he is now critically damaged and should be going down. Well, we are continuing away, evade the head-on, fire a few shots. Fair enough. Lock up the tornado with the radar. Again, waiting for the AIM-9C to acquire a target. Although at this height it... Oof. Oh, he has decoyed my radar. He dropped the uh, chaff. And now he's too close for a missile shot, so I am trying to get him with the guns here. Again, he's, fl he's chaffing my radar. But my guns are up, I'll eat the target, and that took off his tail, it seems, and he should be going down. Plenty of targets to choose from now. Again, you see how quickly the battle unfolds, and whoo, flare that missile. And now I have uh, several enemies on my tail, which means I am making a run for it right now, trying to uh, bait them for one of our teammates to come in and get some free kills. To make that big SMT is hot on my trail and he's gaining on me. Again, I just put off the afterburner, drop one flare and that decoys his missile. The F8's heat signature is not that great, which means you can get away with just dropping one flare. And the tornado is down and meanwhile the F5C has managed to clear my tail of the MiG-21 SMT, which means we are now free to re-engage Selecting the Jaguar as a target, but I think he's, yeah, okay, he was already uh, dead. We are top of the bot at the moment. Only the Tornado in sight and the MiG-21, which means those are the target we want to engage. We still have plenty of missiles left. And as you can see, we are just breaking the sound barrier. Even at 10 free, the Crusader is not the fastest, at least not at low altitude. And one of our MiG 21s has just kicked the bucket. And I just noticed, whoa, that was a MiG 21 BIS, so we are in a full up tier. Oh my god! Alright! So we are do doing pretty well for ourselves right now. And we're taking the Crusader high and above. Perching ourselves above the Tornado, which is most likely trying to get another bomb run. And we are slotting in right behind his 6. Select the Heat Seeking AIM-9D and we are so close that even if he flares, the missile is most likely to hit. But he doesn't flare, and boom, the missile hits its target. There's my next kill. Convert the built-up energy from that power dive back into altitude. Because it's always good to have some altitude. Gives you more flexibility. And we 
are not facing the danger of Doppler radar anymore. There are no F-14s involved, no F-4Js. There's only one tornado left. And the tornado doesn't get any radar missiles. Which means we are now waiting for him to make his run. Oh wait, I think there's also a MiG-21 left, if I remember earlier. And we are just waiting near their base, seeing if they take off or if they uh, refuse to DJ out. So we are putting the Crusader in cruise mode. Put off the afterburner for a moment so that we still have enough fuel because we are already at under 10 minutes. Okay, someone has activated an Avenger. So that gives us the position of the MiG-21. He is at a space and it looks like he is about to take off. Still have one AIM-9D and uh, one AIM-9C left. However, at those kind of altitudes, the m 9 c is completely useless. The radar will never gain lock at those kind of low altitudes. So our aim 9 d and our guns are best choices and already the base is firing uh, SAMs at us, so we are staying well clear of that. and give the MiG-21 a fighting chance. Again, going for aircraft on the runway is pretty uncool. And I don't do it at all. A bombing aircraft on their base, that's a different thing. That's actually pretty funny, but uh, just going in at the base and gunning them down while they are defenseless on the runway, I don't know, that's not really my style. I don't like doing that. At least give them the, the choice of uh, either jaying out or continue the fight. And it seems the F5 is on an attack run. Uh, the A5, the A7. And there's the tornado as well. He has, he has taken off. Let's see what's going to happen. I bet the A7 is going to go head on. Yeah, sure seems like that. He's past the tornado and oh he's going for the MiG-21 and oh he's actually got him okay uh, now he died so that leaves only the tornado and he is airborne he's near his base oh, no, I try to uh, set him up for a heat seeker but the missile does not uh, acquire the target okay and now he has me on the defensive oh he's fired the missile again Put off the afterburner, drop on flare, and that even defeats the AIM-9L of the tornado. We are now dangerously low on fuel, so... We need to be careful here. Okay, lost sight of him. I need to go back to base. Let's, let's still have that AIM-9D left to just... Just fire it, just in case. I doubt it's gonna hit. We are way too... Oh, you know what? He seems to be on landing approach. We might be able to... Yeah, I use, I use the SPAA as uh, range reference. If we get this thing below 4 kilometers... This might hit. Fox 2, missile away. Let's see. Oh, oh! It's actually already there. Oh, there it is. Come on, no way. No way this is gonna hit! <laughs> LOL, I can't believe that happened. <laughs> oh well, I bet he didn't see that coming. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> that was great. Well, I still fired the missile while he was on... Uh, in the air, so I didn't shoot him down one while he was on the runway, technically. 
And here it seems we have found our way into one of those huge as BVR maps. We are already at altitude, 8000 meters and climbing slowly. And as you can see, I'm trying to conserve some fuel. I've already burned some minutes and radar has picked up targets. There are several contrails in the sky above. And the F4C ahead also seems to have spotted them. Yep, he has launched uh, what seems to be an AIM-7. But the AIM-7... Does he get the AIM-7D or C? I don't know, but that's not a very good radar missile anyways, and he has missed. Meanwhile, radar has locked up a MiG-21. And FOX-1, AIM-9C has acquired the target. Come on. And it has hit the target right at the apex of the Fruit Cloud soundtrack. Which, by the way, it's one of the best soundtracks they added in uh, the last patches, I think. Second AM9C away, and it too has hit the target, which means 2 for 2 for the AM9C. I have locked up the next MiG 21 on my radar, however, he is much faster than I. So. No real other targets spotted right now, so might as well tr see what he's gonna do. Because there's nothing there for him to get. So he's most likely... Uh, breaking off soon, hopefully come my direction. What's he doing? Is he on a bombing run? In a MiG-21? Well, that's not the best aircraft to do it with, buddy, but meh. Seems the case, and unfortunately he's now so low to the ground that ground clutter has confused my radar and I have lost track of him. By the way, I am right now, um, I have this aircraft only equipped with the flare, so no chaff, since this is most likely a down tier. There are F4Cs involved, so we should not be higher than 11.0. Which means there are. It is unlikely that there are any high tier radar missiles that can threaten me. And in these situations where there are certainly more heat seekers, get, getting, uh, giving the uh, Crusader a full loadout of flares can actually prove to be uh, the better choice. And as you can see, I am um, occasionally flaring just in case I might miss. Uh, a long-range heat-seeking missile fired at me. Because you never know, sometimes the game just doesn't really show you. So just in case I drop some flares, and see, since I already uh, have an excess of them, still have 42 flares remaining. So, no big deal. The SU-22 was spotted. Oh yeah, there, there's an F4F on the enemy team, so there, we are definitely 11.0. MiG-21 is the only viable target spotted right now. So we are heading his direction. And I am just longing for a good one versus one dogfight, so I hope the MiG-21 picks up the bait. Oh, there's an A5 as well. Yeah, because these big, um, these huge BVR maps are your best chance of getting real good one versus one dogfights, which is just something the F8 is built for. All right, and there are at least two enemy aircraft up ahead. Again, I am constantly checking my surroundings just in case I miss something because I don't want to be knocked out of the sky by a long-range. Uh, heat-seeking missile, or something like that. And Radar has picked up a contact, probably the A5C. Let's see, it should be visible soon what type of aircraft it is. If it's the MiG-21 or the A5. There's another contact right next to it. And of course the two AIs. Come on. Seems to be heading my way. 
What are you? Oh! Oh, so, so it was an AI after all. Damn it. Oh, oh, and there's the A5. Oh, God. Whew. And that's what I meant. You always need to keep track of your surroundings. The A5 has fired a heat seeker, so after burn off, flare deployed, confuse this missile, deploy the air brake to initi initiate a dogfight. But he seems not to be interested. Hmm, lost a lot of speed here, so air brake retracted. Yeah. Oh, oh, there's the second A5. Okay. We had optimal dogfighting speed now, so let's. We are try. I'm trying to initiate. Yeah, come on. Initiating a, a rolling scissor maneuver. Pretty complex air um, air combat maneuver. I am. You need to constantly check your energy in a rolling scissors because your um, desire is to get the enemy aircraft in front of you. Try to force him to overshoot. And now the SO-22 is also getting involved, and oof, this could be interesting. <laughs> see what the SO-25, SO-22 is gonna do. Okay, seems he's he's going away, so it's back to the A5 versus me, and this is how, has now turned into a classical uh, dogfight. We are bank banking as sharply as our aircraft allow us to trying to get the enemy 6 and I feel like I'm slowly gaining I don't know full afterburn deployed flaps also Oof. yet this is just what the F8 Crusader has built for one versus one dogfights and I'm now there might be a chance of me yeah, getting the drop on film if I get it into the vertical, taking advantage of the Crusader's raw power. Ah, not enough, not enough. Okay. Back to the horizontal it is, then. Off afterburner, we don't want to overshoot. Again into the vertical, deploy full afterburner again. And... Cut power, come on, this might be it. Oh yeah, this is it, this is it, come on, come on, come on, come on! And yes, there it is! <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> what a dogfight! Damn! And kudos to the A5 Steepler, he fought that very well. I mean, he, he gave me a good run for my money. And... Unfortunately, the dogfight has now burned most of my fuel. We are, by the way, at three kills on top of the leaderboard. And we are definitely, definitely needing to head back to base. This will be quite a long journey. Let's hope I can make it. Whew. And turns out I have barely managed to make it. We have touched down pretty rough landing to be honest. But yeah, we just made it with less than two minutes on the clock. Alright, come on, come on, slow down. Of course this thing has no brake parachute, sadly. And we are rearming and refueling. Oh boy! <laughs> yeah, but this uh, this quite just shows what the F8 Crusader is just uh, able to do. By the way, I am now planning something different. I am equipping the AIM-9C. Come on, where is it? Uh, more fuel? Because I don't don't want to run off, out of fuel again. We're now at 45 minutes of fuel, this should definitely give us enough time to stay up in the air for longer, okay. Ahead is just an AI. Ok, 
Come on. Okay, and one of the enemy pirates has, has uh, activated the blind hunt order. Oh, and I'm the target. Great. That's actually that actually is pretty cool because uh, this means the enemy aircraft have me on on uh, on the screen highlighted. They know where I am and they're coming to me, which means I might get the chance for another good one versus one. So we are at... Okay. We, we are making good speed, which means I can now power climb the Crusader up in the sky. To might give me the chance uh, of an Aim9C shot. Okay, let's see, let's see. Where could they be? Ah! Ah! There's the SU-22! Okay! And we're the only player able to engage him right now. So again, a nice one versus one. He has fired a missile but missed. Deploy the air brake. I mean, it's an SU-22 when... He has no business really trying to dogfight a crusader. That's not what the S22 is built for, which means I am easily able to evade him and stay behind him to set me up for a missile shot. Aim9D it is, and fire away, Fox 2, lock him up with the radar just in case. I think he has dropped flares, but he's, yeah, he was still probably on full afterburner and the missile went for his afterburner plume instead of the flares. A5C, he's the last aircraft on the enemy team. Come on, yeah, and I'm hoping that the A5 will dogfight me as well. I just want another dogfight like uh, one against the other A5. That was just so cool. We are at four kills right now, so there's a real chance of me getting an ace. Yeah, and he's right there, okay. You know what, let's give him my location. Let's see if he goes for it. I mean, the A A5 and the Crusader both are very maneuverable aircraft. Depending on how good he is, he can actually kill me. Both aircraft certainly uh, can out dogfight each other. Really depends on the pilot. And I'm closing in on him. Yeah, okay, but he crashed. Oh, damn it. Ah, I so wanted that ace. But, well, four kills. It is certainly a good result, anyway, so, yeah. Terror of the sky. First place on the team. And let's see the results. Eh, I mean, that's okay. That's okay. But yeah. So, and now I'm gonna show you what an ace looks like in an up tier with the Crusader. We are here at 11 0. We do have a MiG 21 Lazar M on our team, so this is most definitely an up tier, and there is an F4J on, in, on the enemy team as well. And I have just locked my first target, it's a J-35 with the Crusader's radar. And I'm just waiting for him to be in missile range, prepare for an A-9C launch, missile should be acquiring the target anytime soon, there it is. Fox one missile away and it tracks beautifully, he tries to evade, but way too late, and this gives me my first kill of this match.
plenty of targets to choose from down below. Quickly check my, check my surroundings, I'm clear to engage. There are two F5Cs. They seem to be distracted, so I'm switching to the A9Ds. Cut power, slot in behind them. First missile launched and quickly launched the second one at the other F5C. There's one kill and there's two kills. Quickly took out three dangerous targets on the enemy team in quick succession. But now there's another F5 that has the hearts on for me. He is launching an A9E. I just cut power and drop one set of flares and decoy the missile. He breaks off, which means I am clear to re-engage and I am taking the Crusader up into the vertical to set myself up for another high speed run on any of those targets. In this situation you really don't want to get caught down below uh, by any F5Cs because the F5C it is a very good dogfighter but he is coming for me, I try to get him with an a c he chaffs the missile at the last second I'm not even gonna bother dogfighting him, I'm just gonna go plus three straight ahead, try to get another, some shots in on another F5, but miss. And again, we are not trying to dogfight the F5s, they're not following us. Anyway, instead I am switching my sights onto that A7D. Another F5 coming in, get some shots in, miss, evade his shots barely, and plowing straight through, gonna go for the A7D. Switch to the guns, I'm all out of missiles anyway. Tr and fire a long burst of 20mm cannon ammunition. Get him critical, which is enough to down him eventually. There it is. And now I'm very, very low on fuel. So I am gonna go back to base to refuel and rearm. We do want to get more of those missiles. Because against F5s you don't want to fight the one versus one down low and at low speeds. They, the F5 is an incredibly good dogfighter. A competent F5 player can out dogfight an F8 Crusader, even a competently flown one. So I want to engage him from some range. And the F8's uh, better standoff capabilities certainly help with that. We do have two excellent uh, heat seekers and two very very good uh, radar guided missiles and a lot of F5 players they don't tend to take uh, chaff with them so our A9Cs might be our best sh uh, best shot at them. But first I need to RTB. I am very very low on fuel. Less than two minutes remaining. I pop the air brake and uh, I'm just trying to slow down notice how I don't deploy my landing gear because uh, when you deploy the landing gear the air brake automatically retracts so I'm waiting until the last moment to deploy the gear and you want to come in with the Crusader at the lowest speed possible because of the variable incident swing um, if you come in too fast you just float over the runway and just look how slow I can get with the Crusader look at that those are landing speeds you would uh, assume on propeller driven aircraft, not on the 1950s uh, supersonic jet fighter. But anyways, we have touched down and we are coming to a stop and gonna go rearming. We do have the numbers advantage, at least now, against the enemy team. There's another crusader coming in for landing and two F5s up ahead. Unfortunately, it won't stay that way for long. Yeah, the Crusader has crashed short of the runway. Probably he seemed to be damaged. And, um, yeah, those F5s are trying to shoot down the last enemy aircraft on the team right over the airfield. So, yeah, and we are skipping ahead. Because the other F5s have died to enemy airfield defenses, of course, and now I'm the last player on my team. And that F5, which is thankfully spotted by the uh, Blind Hunt Rager, is the last guy on the enemy team. And I am taking the Crusader up high, I am trying to get the drop on him. 
is. So that in case he uh, in case he evades, I can just push ahead and uh, get the crusade into another power climb, get away from him. I'm preparing for an A9D launch, but through the clouds, the missile does not want to acquire the target. I need to get down low. Still doesn't want to acquire the target. I'm thinking of switching to the guns. But I just wait for a little longer and the missile finally uh, locks the target and kaboom, there's my fifth kill. Just won this match and got an ace for my troubles. Yeehaw! <laughs> and yeah, that shows that even with up tiers, the Crusader can be a fantastic aircraft to fly. You just need to know when to engage and what to engage. Anyways, let's see these results. Look at that. This was a comparatively long match, over 10 minutes long. And uh, yeah, not bad. Not bad at all. Top of the leaderboard as it should be. So, and here for the final presentation, I'm going to show you the best game I've had so far with the F8 Crusader. We have found our way into a down tier here. Again, over a snowy map. And I have two A9Cs and two A9Ds equipped, running this aircraft on 30 minutes of fuel. And we're just straight he uh, heading into the middle of the map. Radar is already picking up contacts. Which means I am able to lock up the first aircraft on my radar, prepare an A9C. And let's see if I can knock this first target out of the sky. He's already in missile range. Take a quick look around. It's an F-104. N9C has acquired a target. Missile away. Fox 1. He tries to flare it, but of course the N9C is a radar missile. Boom, there's my first kill. MiG-21 launches the missile at me. I decoy it and evade his shots. Several targets now spotted below me. Pick up the Milan, try launching an AIM-9D since he's in, it's in a good position. Pretty bad lo uh, launch angle, but the AIM-9D is able to track it anyway. And it has killed the Milan. A5C ahead. Again, quickly look around. And now we are in a little bit of a safe spot. No target spotted except the A5, which means... Why not? I am in range of that Yak-38 AI. Might as well go for a target opportunity. Don't like going for AI aircraft since I didn't it... Uh, well, it, it uh, inflates the KD with non-player vehicles, which is something I don't really like. But fortunately or unfortunately, whatever you want, however you want to see it, I miss it. And now there are several targets near me that I can try to get the kill. Fox 2 at the SU-25, but the missile goes for his flares instead. We're not even uh, going to bother going after the SU-25. There's an A4N ahead. But the MiG-23 is so up, so far up high, it is a perfect target for the AIM-9C. Radar has picked him up, but the missile has not, not yet locked him. Uh, I guess the clouds are confusing the radar. Now he is in more clear area. Get a clear lock. Fox 1, missile away. And the AIM-9C hits its target, giving me my third kill. We are now all out of missiles, but do have almost all of our ammunition. Which means it's time to mean gunfighter means something again. Lock up the A5C with the radar call him out and we're going in as you can see I have only two guns selected so I am able to conserve ammunition and I'm slotting in from behind get some long-range shots off come on manage to crit him and he's trying to evade I cut power to not overshoot him and look how the crusader is able to stay inside the turn of the A5, blast off his wing, giving my fourth kill, and we are just now going straight ahead, 
diving down and trying to get some shots in on the A on the A4N. He is in a little bit of a pickle anyways, he has an F5C on his tail and another F5 close by. As well as the Harrier, well the Harrier is, is uh, too far away. Anyways, I am picking up with the radar, lining up the shot and get a crit in. Damage of left wing, we are not going to follow him, instead we are going to power through and try to attack DA5 up high. We are coming in at good speed. We're easily slotting in behind him and yeah, that's the end of this guy and we are now at 5 kills giving it giving us an ace in a flight and now it's only the A4N. Trying to get in before the Harrier kills him and for, fortunately the Harrier misses which means I am able hopefully now to slot right in and get my 6 kill. Skyhawk slow on energy and speed. Tries to evade me, but well, it's too late. And I set him on fire. And that's the end of him. And that's six kills for the F8E Crusader. And that so far has been my best match with the F8. 3,425 mission points, 6 kills, what a match. Let's see then these final results. And as you can see 55,000 credits, it's, well... Eh, for 6 kills you would expect more, but then again it's not a premium. But anyways, with the Crusader, for me at least, it's more about the fun. And with that we come to an end to this presentation about the wonderful F8 Crusader. This thing really is one hell of an aircraft. I dare to say it has replaced the Heinkel 162 as my favorite jet to fly in War Thunder. It really is that good. This really is such an incredible performer, and at the same time, it's not OP. I mean, it does have its weaknesses. You can shoot a Crusader down, but it's the way you need to work around those weaknesses to really make the Crusader work to its full potential. And once you manage that, this thing becomes just such a rewarding aircraft to fly. It has very, very, very good responsiveness to, to input. It has adequate armament. And um, just its flight performance alone makes this aircraft worthwhile. It really is a phenomenal aircraft in War Thunder. A true pilot's dream if you ask me. And as well it should. I mean, th when this thing came around during the 1950s, this thing really was something. And uh, it is here in War Thunder as well. The last of the gunfighters. The last aircraft with the cannon designed as its main armament. And if you want a good rank 7 gr grinder, um, forget this one. Slap a talisman on this bad boy and go to town with it. Because this right now really is one of the most fun aircraft you can fly in War Thunder in my opinion. I thoroughly, thoroughly would recommend this aircraft. And with that I'd say we end this video. I really hope you enjoyed this guide and I'll see you in the next one.